friend, God does not deal with you as you deserve. If you were to be like that, you will not survive. Here is why your perspective of God is powerful. Number one, how you see God will be your limitation or your ladder. Your perspective of God will either limit you from knowing God better and getting deeper with Him or become a ladder from which you step to know Him deeper and have a better relationship with Him. Number two, how you see God you inform how you obey him, which is, are you obeying him to get him to love you and accept you, or are you obeying him to honor him, to reverence him? Number three, how you see God directly affects your relationship with him, how you relate with him. Jesus asked the disciples in Matthew chapter 16, whom do men say that I am? They said, you are Elijah, Elisha, or one of the prophets. He said, then who do you say that I am? That is a perspective question. What do you think of me? Who do you say that I am? That affects your relationship, how you see him, how you perceive him. Number four, how you see God affects your relationship with people and your world, which is your environment, your workplace, your church, and everywhere you meet people in your neighborhood. Because if you see God as a kind God, you will want to be like him to be kind to others, to be good to others. If you see God as love, as good, you would want to portray that. Now, to go deeper on this, I have four points to share with you. How do you see God? Number one, do you see God as a master or as a father? From a personal place, growing up from a religious background, I did not really feel God personally. There was not this personal in-depth understanding of God, of his love, of his personality, but I only operated through the religious do's and don'ts. All I wanted was to be accepted by him because I felt like I was not accepted because God is so holy and I am so dirty. And in scriptures, that was Peter's experience. When Jesus got to him, Peter was on his knee and be like, go far away from me. I am so dirty. You are so holy. So I cannot come to you. Now, that is a relationship of seeing God like, let me just be your slave. You are my master. I'm your slave. Now, that mindset has been a mindset that a lot of believers, Christians, are carrying, which is, we go to God in a transaction. God, let me just serve you so that you can do this for me. Let me do this in your house. Let me serve in church. Let me serve in this particular place so that we'll be accepted. I know that I am dirty. I know that I cannot measure up. I'm not worthy to come before you. I'm not worthy to be your child. I'm not worthy to be your son. I'm not worthy to be your daughter. Can I just serve here if I will be accepted? Now that mindset has limited our expression in relationship to God. It limits our faith and how we can receive from him. And you even see some people that say, God, I've been singing for you in the choir for so number of years. But nothing is happening in my life. I've been doing this. I've been serving in this unit. Nothing has changed. That is because your perspective of God has not changed. So nothing will change because your faith has not been improved on. And that is the picture in Luke chapter 15 of the older brother of the prodigal son. Scripture says, the older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. But he replied, all these years I have slept for you. I never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me even a young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet, when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened cow. His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. Now, this is a beautiful heart. Of a good father. He says, you've always been here. Everything I have is yours. Because as your father, you can go and pick the young goat like you desire and make feast with your friends. You can come to me boldly and receive what you need because it is your faith that you can use to appropriate the blessing you need from me. And when I came to see God as a father, it changed my scope of belief. It changed how I relate with him because now I am not a servant. I am an heir. The scripture says we are joint heirs with Christ, that we have not been given the spirit of slavery, but we've been given the spirit of sonship, whereby we can call him Abba, Father. Daddy, he is your daddy, he is your father. 
You don't just see him as a master. Yes, he is Lord over everything, over everyone, but he is your father. You have to see him from a relationship standpoint. Now, this God who is highly exalted is a father who is so close. He is not just some intangible, strange force somewhere far away, but he is a father that understands you, that knows your heart. That is who. And this revelation will give you boldness to come to him. This revelation will give you boldness to come to him and have a good relationship with him. Because as a son, you do not obey your father so that you will be accepted and loved by him. You obey him to reverence him, to honor him, to respect him. That is why you obey his rule. But as a servant, you would obey him out of fear so that he will not cast you out, so that he will not reject you. You obey to be accepted. And if you still have the mindset of obeying God to be accepted and having the fear that if you don't obey, God will cast you out, you are having a servant mindset. And God is telling you through this video that you should be a son because you are. Number two, is God slow? Sometimes when you go through hard times and difficult moments and you need something to happen quickly, you happen to think God is slow. And this is where a lot of people sarcastically say, yeah, God is slow, so I'm going to find my way. And they go in their own wisdom and their own way to their own hearts. Because a lot of people are looking for shortcuts to success shortcuts to blessings and we call God slow because of our limited perspective of him and this mindset of shortcut to success fast food success we see a lot of people being led astray we see a lot of people doing things hurting other people by defrauding people by getting to engage themselves in acts that normally is not humane and all these people want is just to go up just to attain a particular level of what they call success. And my pastor says something that God does not want you to go up, but God wants you to grow up. Because when you grow up, you have roots that sink deep that will sustain the heights that you attain. And that is where I can call God that is a God of process. He is not slow. He just is a God of process. Because everything he does is in his wisdom and in his will for our best interest. Now let's come back to this idea. Why do you think that God is slow? I believe it is the conflict of our understanding of time and God. Because sometimes we feel like God is constrained by time. God is not constrained by time. Time is a construct that God created for man. Day and night, seasons and all of that. God created it for man to live on earth. But God is not in time. God is outside of time in eternity because he is eternal. That is how you can explain when the scripture says a thousand years is like a day to the Lord and a day is like a thousand years. It will be confusing if you don't understand that God is outside of time. And it used to confuse me so much when I did not get this understanding. I was like, how is a thousand years like a day to God? Like, I cannot wrap my head around this. But how you can understand that is God has time on his hands. And that's why scripture says in Ecclesiastes that it is not the fastest runner that wins the race. It is not the wisest that gets food. And all of that is not men of skill that actually attain success, but it is time and chance. And you have to come to know that your God is not slow, but your God is a God of process, and your God can make Kairos moments, which is right time, right place to happen to you right happenings. Now, if you still hold on to the mindset that God is slow, you would only undermine the wisdom of God and the will of God. In John chapter 11, we see the case of Lazarus, the friend of Jesus, whom he loved so much. The scripture says, Jesus was informed that Lazarus was sick. And he said to his disciples, this sickness is not unto death. But Lazarus died. You know the story. And to us as humans, it would be like, God is slow and God did not come true. I can pause here to say, that when you think God is slow, just wait a moment. God wants to reveal himself in a deeper level than whom you knew him to be before. Because it is in your difficult moments, in that moment of difficulty and what you seem to call impossibility, that God will show up and your faith in God will be strengthened and become deeper. That is what God wants to achieve in you. 
and it wants you to attain a deeper level of faith, but it will come through your patience of waiting on his timing. So Jesus later went to Lazarus' house to meet Mary and Martha after four days of his death. And they said, had it been you were here, our brother would not have died. Now that is understood. Jesus told Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. That is the first time they had and knew that revelation that he is the resurrection himself. He does not just resurrect the dead. He is the resurrection. I don't know what in your story that God wants to reveal to you, which you are saying that God is slow. I do not know the revelation that he wants to bring to your life. You just need to wait and be patient because he is working the process. That is why we say that God is never late, but he is always on time. It is his timing, not our timing. Because we need to know who is in control. God is in control of time, not us. Now I want to give you this. Your urgency does not put God in a state of emergency. Or let me say it this way. Your sense of urgency, immediate need, does not put God in a state of emergency. God is not like, oh, it's urgent for him. It's urgent for her. So now I'm in emergency. I did not know that this was going to happen. No, 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 no. That's not where God is. God knows everything and is always calm. Check the scripture. It will encourage your faith. Jesus never rushed. He was always calm, composed. Even when Jairus came to him and be like, my daughter is dead. We need to rush to my house. Jesus was still on his pace. Then people from Jairus' house came to tell him, just leave the master. Your daughter is already dead. Jesus said, if you believe. He was still on his time, composed. God wants you to learn patience with him. Because he is such a patient God. He wants you to learn patience. Nothing is outside of his control. He is in full control of everything. And anything that happens, if you trust him, it's going to work for your good. It may not be convenient. It may not be comfortable. But it will work for your good. You can't put a deadline on God. And you can't fix God on your timeline. But you only need to subject to his timing for your life. That is where you are safe. Number three, do you need details to trust God? If you wait to have full details before you make a faith move, you will never go anywhere. You will never make a move. And that is because God does not give details, but he gives direction. Over time in my life, I've come to realize that God does not give details. I've come to this understanding and revelation that God will not give details. Because I've been in places that I ask him of details, let me know what will happen, and it never comes. All I need is a direction. Should I go like David? David would always go to God to ask God, can I go? And if God wants to give details, that will be according to his sovereign will, not based on you waiting for him to give the details. So you do not need details to trust God. If you only wait for that, you will never make a faith move. You'll never be able to trust God for anything. You'll never be able to advance in your life. Because most of the things that happen in life, God will want you to explore, to have experience. And this just come to me. If God happens to give you details, you might worship the details and forget God. And coming to a place of understanding that God will not give me details, when he lays an impression on my heart, I go with that. And when I follow his direction through those impressions, I have come to a place that when I look back, I thank God for the direction. If you check for your life and you are sincere, you will see that some of the places that you are right now, that you are enjoying, that you are happier, it is not something that you plan. It just happened because over time, God happened to orchestrate your life and you come to be in a place that you are happier. Even though it is not as you wanted, but it's better for you. It could be in a relationship, you really wanted a particular person, but you did not know that this person might not have been good for you. But at the moment, it felt so good. And you were like, this could work, this would really go so well, you know. But after a period of living life and God orchestrating things, God removed some people from your life, add some other people, and you realize that your life has become better than it was. So this should encourage you and make you not want your way at all when it comes to do with God. But want his way, want his will. Because his will is the best for you. Scripture says about Abraham, By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he left not knowing where he was going. Abraham obeyed God without details. In Isaiah 48, 17, it says, 
This is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God, who teaches you to profit, who leads you in the way you should go. So all you need to ask of God is, is leading. And God will not lead you aside from His Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the companion God gave to you to be there to lead you, to counsel you, to teach you, to help you, to be your standby. And in Psalms 32 verse 8, the scripture says, The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Number four, does God love you only when you do well and get mad at you when you fail? Now, this is for certain that a lot of Christians are in this place and they feel like whenever they fail, God is mad at them. God is with a sledgehammer just ready to hit them on the head. Because this is how God has been portrayed for the longest time in the religious circle. But this is a false representation of God. God is not mad when you fail. God still loves you when you fail. Because he loved you when you were not even up to anything good. The Bible says he commended his love when we were yet sinners which is at a point that we were not even seeking for god not knowing if we could even get to relate with him but he came to form the good relationship with us and we have to accept the relationship in the terms that he said and the terms he said is that he loves us notwithstanding who we are and at first i did not understand what the scripture means by god accepts me just as i am because i felt like i need to go clean myself before I should come to God because God is too holy. How can I approach him? But how could I have been able to cleanse myself without the help of God? If I would have been able to do that without God, then I would not need God to be clean. I would not need God to be pure. I would not need God to be holy or righteous. But because I could not, that is why I need God first so that I can become holy like him. That is why I need this model through Jesus so that I can live my life. So you should not be out here as a Christian thinking that God treats you as you are, that he treats you according to your behavior. Because who deceived you to think that way? If God were to treat you according to your behavior, would you survive till now? Scripture says, the Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to anger and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us, nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. Friend, God does not deal with you as you deserve. If you were to be like that, you will not survive. So you have to debunk this wrong mindset that makes God look like a schizophrenic. God is not this schizophrenic who is fickle, who can just flip on you any moment and change his character and tighten his face and be like, I'm angry at you. Why did you do that? No, no, no. God is not like that. Don't try to give God a bad representation, a bad reputation. Don't let anybody give you a reputation of God that is bad. Get a good opinion of God by reading the word of God for yourself. You will see a picture of a God whose heart longs to love you. Also, do not think that God has mood swings like you do. God does not have bad days like you do. I know sometimes when you are pressured and you have bad days, you could just flip on people. But that is not the picture of God. Because you had a bad day does not mean God has a bad day. Because your mood change does not mean God has a mood change. God does not be like, I've been precious this morning. So many prayers have come in. A lot of churches have prayed to me. So many people have prayed to me. I'm tired. Don't talk to me again. It's late. Oh no, that's not my God. He's never tired. He never slumbers, nor sleeps. Again, God is not mad at you when you do wrong. Instead, his arms are open wide for you to run into his arms. Because what the devil wants to achieve by making you think that God is mad at you when you do wrong is to make you run away from God out of fear. Is to make you run into hiding out of fear. That is why God went in search of Adam, not as if he did not know where Adam was, but he wanted to make Adam know that he is not afraid of how he is, even when he fell. And Jesus painted the picture for us by showing us the prodigal son when he came back after all he did. The father was the one running to him. The father was the one embracing him. The father was the one throwing the feast for him. Ah, to an earthly father, that would have been a real scolding moment. Yeah, I told you. <laughs> I knew you'd be back home. Stubborn child, stubborn kid. I knew you'd be back. Eh? All these children, you will not listen to your parents. No, no, no. God's not like that. 
God is so full of love. God is love. That is what scripture calls it. That he is love. His full expression of love was shown to us at the cross of Calvary, where he sent his only begotten son. And scriptures that we quote popularly, God so loved the world. Who is the world? World doesn't mean Christian. The world means everybody, you, Christian or not, every religion, every person on the face of the earth. God loves everyone. But only those that believe in him will receive this love and this forgiveness. God loves everyone on the face of the earth. But those that believe, which the scripture says, whoever believes shall receive eternal life. It's only those that believe that can receive his life into them. So Christ on the cross took all your sins, the past, present, and the future, and nailed them to the cross, crucified them, such that today you are the righteousness of God in Christ, and not based on your works or your ability to keep the law, but based on Christ fulfilling the law for your sake. And on the third day, he rose from the grave, as your divine receipt that you have been freely forgiven and you are at peace with God. I hope this video is beneficial and it's of help to you. Thank you so much for watching this video and it will be my pleasure to see you in my next video. If you've gained anything valuable from this video, click the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. Follow up for more content like this that will encourage your faith and help you grow spiritually. Thank you for watching. God bless.